All right, welcome back to book review episode 14. It's a good one. Biocentrism. Uh, how life and consciousness are the keys to understanding the true nature of the universe by Robert Lanza. Uh, so at the very top, it has a quote, original and exciting from Deepak Chopra. So when I got this, I was a little concerned that it was going to be a load of crap because that's what Deepak Chopra is. However, uh, this was one of the most mm, perception-altering uh, books I've read. It, it made me question reality and the universe more than anything else I've read, including uh, The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene, uh, the, including uh, 10 Answers to the Big Questions, or Brief Answers to the Big Questions by Stephen Hawking. This book, I think more than any other book, opened my mind to new ideas that I hadn't been exposed to, and it opened my mind to asking questions that I hadn't even conceived of prior to reading this book. And when a book not only answers questions you didn't know the answer to, but also provides you with questions that you never even thought about in the first place, uh, then it's a really good book. So just diving into what biocentrism is, I, my only exposure to this topic is this one book, so I hope I'm accurately portraying what it means. But what I got from the book is biocentrism is the idea that consciousness, or more loosely just an observer of some sort, are necessary for the universe to exist. Um... So it's kind of like a, a macrocosm of the uh, of the question, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, uh, does it make a sound? So applying this idea to not only the perception of sound, but the our, our other senses, but then going beyond that and asking questions like, does something like time exist if there are no observers? Does do, does space exist? Does anything exist? Uh, and if I were to be presented with that idea just off the bat initially, my immediate inclination would be to say no. Even for the the tree falling in the forest, I, I would say, it, um, it, or sorry, not say no, say of course it exists. Um, decline the possibility that a conscious observer is necessary. So in the example of the tree falling in the forest, my immediate assumption prior to reading this book would definitely be, of course, it makes a noise. Like, duh, why? It makes no sense that it wouldn't make a noise. Um, but that quickly changed. So he tackles that um, microcosm example within the book and then builds upon it to the point in which he's talking about the universe as a whole. And... Uh, it, he practically changed my mind on everything. So he provides seven sort of fundamental or keys to biocentrism. He spends the first 15 or so chapters sort of qualifying why he believes each of these is true and each one builds upon the other and, uh, increases its complexity. So, but just to give an example to the reader of what it's, the, the sort of ideas he presents, um, for, for the example of the tree, he's arguing that if the tree falls in the woods, it doesn't make any sound if there's no one there to hear it. What it does do is it might make sound wave, or sorry, it might make air wave pulses throughout the atmosphere and our brains have adapted to convert the information of air vibrating into something that we inside our heads then 
perceive as audio, but audio itself is not an innate quality of airwaves moving. Uh, for example, or for another analogy would be if I see uh, the color red and someone else sees the color red as blue, uh, there's no objective truth to who is right because really what is happening is a photon is reflecting off of whatever I see as red and uh, the light is emitted with a certain wavelength and that goes into my eyes and my eyes are biologically set up to process that wavelength in my brain as being red. Whereas the person who sees it as blue, same exact process occurs, but their the biology is slightly different to which they see it as blue. Now, uh, maybe um, almost universally amongst the entire population, there may be more agreement with one of those two, uh, with either me or the other person. But that doesn't change the fact that there isn't really an objective truth to something is actually red or something is actually blue or something actually makes a sound. Uh, And that is an idea that now seems obvious to me, but it was so mind blowing when I first read it and it immediately bubbled up a ton of questions in my head. And what I really like about books is when I'm reading them and I get so many more questions because of the way it forces me to think to the point where I need to like take a break from the book and kind of digest all these new questions that I have that the book may not even touch upon, but it then inspires a curiosity of mine to continue uh, researching those questions on my own. So I need to look at the camera more. Um, Like another good analogy Uh, would be, you should just read the book, but another good analogy that the book doesn't provide, but just to put this idea into perspective would be, um, uh, I'm I'm not sure about the actual truth and what I'm about to say, but a bat, for example, or some echolocating animal may take in audio signals or airwaves vibrating or moving, Uh, and then convert that into a visual scene, whereas we convert it into an audio. So the, the idea behind here is our perception of reality is purely manipulated and dictated by our own biology, and our own biology really has no bearing on what is objectively true in the world. And this was easy enough for me to grasp for dealing with things like sound, taste, sight. It gets really weird when you start talking about things like time and like space. And I'm going to actually have to reread those chapters because they got, they got pretty confusing. Uh, and it wasn't like a woo woo, like he's throwing out a bunch of big words to make it seem like he's intelligent. It's not like that at all. Um, he use it, He goes over detailed explanations of a lot of quantum experiments, which I really enjoyed, uh, all sort of to uh, bolster the claim that the reality is in this probabilistic amorphous state until a conscious observer uh, gets involved, and that's when the wave function of everything collapses into what we see as reality. So just a much larger uh, universal scale of the Schrodinger's cat uh, uh, thought experiment, kind of. So yeah, just I, I really like this book. It's fairly short. It's 200 pages, and it reads really quickly. Uh, usually... The crazy deep thought, uh, the the books that really make you think, um, take me a while. 
that I have to read like 30 pages and then I'm kind of burnt and then I have to go do something else and come back to it later. Uh, this didn't really feel that way. I, I could read, you know, 80 plus pages without really losing any uh, stamina on this book because although the ideas really challenge you, they're presented in such a captivating and enjoyable way uh, that doesn't try to overuse complex scientific jargon or mm, details uh, and not in a bad way not in the sense that it's lacking that but in the sense that it wasn't really necessary a lot of the times a lot of the time so i hope i <laughs> i kind of just rambling here but it's an amazing book and i'm going to reread it right now and i recommend everyone reads it because in terms of nonfiction, philosophy uh, quantum related books, quantum physics related books. This has been probably the most interesting I've read so far. Uh, I, it, it seems as though the, the way the author was describing biocentrism and how uh, academics look at biocentrism it seems as though it's, uh, I, I wouldn't say unaccepted, but more of an unrecognized worldview. The idea that there can't be a grand unified theory that doesn't entail consciousness is probably weird for physicists to consider as a possibility. Uh, because it seems it seems weird that consciousness would somehow have some logical fit into what we've been spending uh, years trying to describe with mathematical equations and how consciousness would fit into that uh, is well currently kind of uncomprehensible unless you just except biocentrism. So I don't know if anything I just said made sense, even to myself. So I'm going to just assume it didn't, but that's okay. Um, thank you for watching. I'm going to give this book a 9.03, right in that nine tier. Second book in a row. That was, was that English? Second book in a row that was above a nine so i got lucky with my pickings recently so yeah definitely recommend it very accessible to uh all audiences you don't have to be equipped with a background on quantum physics or even uh introductory background on quantum physics or biology or anything uh which also made it more enjoyable for me so yeah thank you so much for watching i'm going to try to up the frequency of these book reviews uh i didn't do a meat of the month episode because i haven't really read that much last month which is kind of disappointing but i'm going to try to try to get to two three a week now so yeah Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed.